What would you say is the most important skill to have in a survival situation involving cold and wet weather? It'd be hard to dispute that getting a hot fire going is at the top of that list. And we're about to show detailed, specific, up-close instructions on how to get a big hot fire going in cold, wet conditions. I'm Luke, this is Wilderness Strong, and where we live in the Pacific Northwest, it rains a lot. Some people get down and discouraged about that, but we just see opportunity for a challenge, for fun, and most importantly, a chance to practice wet weather fire making. In our last video, we covered the valuable gifts of fire making resources that a cedar tree can provide. What if we can't find one? Well, here's our next move. When it's soaked like this, we are constantly on the lookout for rotten things. Dead trees, rotting stumps, old spongy, punky limbs and logs. Why? Because that's where dry rot lives. You probably already heard about dry rot for fire making, but like so many things in wilderness survival and specifically fire making, the smallest details make the difference between cold and warm, wet and dry, life or death. Now here's some life-saving dry rot details. When we come across a rotten stump or tree, we start by breaking off the biggest chunks we can get. You'll see that we're gonna break down these chunks into dust and small pieces, but we're absolutely going to save a nice big pile of the big chunks for our main source of heat and warmth after our fire gets well established. Okay, this is probably the most crucial part of the processing, breaking it down small even into dust. This step often gets skipped, which leads to failed fire attempts because the ember doesn't have enough small particles to grab onto and spread. You've got to take the extra time to break it down small. Friction fires are ideal for lighting up dry rot because right out of the gates, we're starting with a smoldering ember that'll transfer nicely into the dust and the small particles of the rot that we collected. Even though we started with a nice ember, it is easy to lose it at this point. This phase is all about nurture, keeping constant, steady air on that ember until it becomes established enough to accept small additions of the dry rot. This is not the time to let up and get overconfident. We want that ember to keep growing and spreading. So we're gonna stay on this one until we're positive that it's safe to start adding in the additional materials. Now this is the stage where we are thankful that we saved a nice big pile of rotten chunks. This is where the real heat is gonna be generated from. One misconception from some about using dry rot is that you can only use it as a starter for your fire, but not as your main fuel. But experience has thankfully taught us that we could build this dry rot fire into a raging mountain of rot from this point, just by continuing to pile on giant chunks of dry rot from the stumps that we found. Now, igniting dry rot with a ferro rod in wet conditions is not as easy as just dropping down sparks on it from above. So we're gonna go back to our charring method that we demonstrated on cedar in the last video. Again, steady, consistent strikes with the intent of heating and charring the area until it'll accept a group of sparks. Once it accepts, we quickly push the sparks together and provide quick air to get it established. From this point, it's all about nurture and gradually building it up into a hot fire. Please, please tell me how cottonwood earned a reputation in bushcraft folklore as such a poor fire making material. For years, I've read and heard firsthand from people how bad cottonwood is for all things fire related, which does not match at all our experience with it. Not only is it great for friction fires, but a big chunk of cottonwood dry rot like we have here is a treasure in a wet weather fire situation like this. Yes, I'm aware cottonwood might not burn as long or as hot as some varieties, but I will always come to the defense of cottonwood because of the great experiences that we've had in the past with it. This demo with the ferro rod in wet winter conditions hopefully will be one more successful step in my personal quest to exonerate cottonwood. What if you were cold, wet, had no shelter options immediately around you, maybe near hypothermic, and you had to get warm now? 
Well, we always ask ourselves questions like this. We'll show you something we've done more than once in the past. It starts by saying to ourselves, hey, I know it's raining, but let's just set this whole stump on fire. We start by digging back into the stump a ways after we found a dry area, which wasn't very hard with this one. We've also laid a couple of chunks right over the top of our mini fire cave just to break the rain a bit. Now again, this stage is all about nurture and gradually increasing the size of our rot chunks after we're confident that the ember is established and spread. One of the best mindsets to have in wilderness survival is to go beyond thinking what should be done or the right way to do something and get outside the box by learning what could be done and what's possible. The wilderness doesn't adjust its circumstances to our specific skills and knowledge. We need to get ourselves educated in multiple ways of accomplishing tasks like fire making so we can increase our chances of being able to deal with unpredictable situations in the wild. Of course, we'd rather be under a shelter, and this isn't our first option, but it is an option. This thing is packed full of dry rot, and we know from experience that we can turn this entire stump into a source of heat to keep us warm even while it's raining. This isn't where we want to stay for very long, but until we find shelter, we'd rather be warm and wet than cold and wet. Now, let's say we've warmed up, but we're still soaking wet. Well, the goal still needs to be finding shelter, and we really don't want to make a fire again from scratch. Well, dry rot will do a great job holding a smolder long enough for us to transfer it to a more protected area where we can add some shavings and turn this into a nice big fire. Now, even though we know that we can salvage a lot of the wet wood we find by shaving off layers until we get into the dry stuff, we're still careful to start out with dead wood that is still attached to the tree. This is preferable to grabbing wood that's been laying on the ground for a while, and it almost always provides us with the dry wood that we need after we've shaved into it. Now, one thing we have not covered in these wet weather fire videos is using wet tinder. Now, what am I even talking about? Wet tinder? Why would we even bother picking up this stuff? Well, we're gonna show you something truly unique that proves there is a place for wet tinder in wilderness survival. You're gonna get a full wet tinder crash course in the next video as we continue our journey making fire in the rain. Anyway, this storm was a big one. I mean, it, it dark clouds with quite below the, the clouds all the way to the ground. Turned in the bottom of the swale and a, a little flash flood came. And it turned into just a mudslide and they, they couldn't get the bikes back out. Well, it was raining so very hard and we had to wait for the helicopter, which wasn't going to come because of the cloud cover. I got a little ember going and uh, put the pieces on it and then carried it down to where they were at and then took arm load after arm load of this big dry rot. And I had a, the dry rot pile about this big and about this wide and we were standing there underneath the fire with coals coming down. How big around was the... Oh man, it was huge. <laughs> it was a huge fire. And so all day long they had a fire about six feet tall stacking. Dry rot? Yeah, dry rot. And they, they were standing around it as happy as could be while it was pouring down rain. What are you going to name the video? This one we're doing now? Yeah. Uh, wet weather, something, fire in the rain, how to make a fire in the rain. I know that song. You know that song? Yeah. Fire in the rain? Yeah. The James Taylor? Yeah. Can you do it? Yeah, I can fire. No, Wilderness Strong is all about nature, bushcraft, ethnobotany, and wilderness survival. If this is your first time with us, we do our best to show unique, up-close, detailed videos on these subjects. Make sure you subscribe, hit the like button, and turn on the notifications, and leave us a comment. We love hearing from you all. Thanks for watching.